I am the real Captain Kirk, and I've been stuck here in this parallel universe where my life is a TV show, and I have to play the part of a struggling actor. <laughs> okay, my name is Ed Zephyr, I am the writer and director of Star Trek Infinities, where I also play the lead role of Captain Kirk. This film is a proof of concept. What concepts? So a few different concepts, perhaps. This is something that I hope fans will enjoy. It's not about replicating anything. It's not about being too nostalgic, but it is about conveying something recognizable. This short film is a vignette from a non-existent episode. A diplomatic mission's gone wrong, there's been an attack, Kirk has escaped with this alien scientist and they're trying to work out a way to repair the communicator to resolve the situation. And we have one of these moments where we see a window into the character's soul. He's one of the most iconic characters in uh, television, sci-fi, there's half a century of fandom that have loved this character for years and years and years. And to me, it's because of who he specifically is. He is not just some guy. He is as specific as Spock. And once you start messing with that, you end up with not quite the same character. I think uh, the fans are going to enjoy seeing the character of Kirk in a way that is very recognizable as the original uh, character. I've heard people say things like something quite difficult to achieve because you don't want to get into realms of parody or imitation. To do an impression of the original character would be insulting to it or it, it would, wouldn't be good to do. And I completely agree. But there's a difference between doing that and doing it so differently but it's not the same character. One of the problems with the perception of Kirk, Erin Horakova writes very eloquently about this, and she in fact coined the term Kirk Drift, and it's the difference between the original character on screen, how he actually manifests, and the pop culture perception of Kirk. When I'm out and about, and people say, oh, do Kirk, do Kirk. And I'm standing there being this very naturalistic uh, rendition of the character. Then I'll say, what do you mean? And they will do a perfect impression of Kevin Pollock. Captain's Law. <laughs> Start eight, two, four, seven, six point five. I've ended up in, in, in kind of cosplay competitions <laughs> and I've given the crowd what they want. I've done a spoken word song. Because it gives me emotional security when we're delivered. You give my ship direction. He makes everything so logical. I've done a, a bit of that exaggeration. Because I can't fight this simple feeling anymore. I've forgotten what I started fighting for. <laughs> but when you're on camera, it does not work. You have to dial it back completely. He's the most incredible person I know. Tell me. This is not an impersonation, this is not an impression, this is an evocation. In literature, as opposed to real life, we see devices used to describe characters. Take, for example, the villain. I always use the example of Darth Vader in Star Wars. All in black, he's this huge, intimidating, threatening character. Not all villains have to be that, but, you know, he is codified for you to interpret very clearly. If you messed with that, if you changed something about it, you made him purple, it wouldn't read the same way. So we have that for a reason. Kirk is the same. And you get this idea of Kirk especially when you study the way fans have written, illustrated, examined uh, the character for, for years and years and years. Golden hair, golden eyes, golden skin, the uniform is gold, and it's very symbolic of his character. One of the things that I get messages from fans is you embody him, your body is the same, and, and this is important. Um, I think it's because even his build, his height, 
in the series, DeForest Kelly would call Shatner bubble butt. I get that, I get the praise for having the same ass. Uh, you know, it seems very silly, but the but the idea of this character who, you know, he's always getting the ripped shirts, he's, he's not contained, but he is wrapped in, you know, close-fitting uniform, and he hides nothing. But it's very symbolic of his effusive character. He is very expressive. His body is very expressive. He's very unselfconscious, and, and the body type plays into that. He wasn't just a description in, in, in a book, a guy of a certain age or, or whatever. He was created on screen. All those specific elements of him describe this unique character. We look at a side of Kirk that is essential to him, his relationship with Spock, because to me, you can't understand Kirk unless you understand his relationship with Spock. Throughout the series, Kirk connects with a certain type of person. We see his past partners, a lawyer in the movies, Carol Marcus, who's a scientist. The third season is very difficult for Kirk. He experiences a lot of manipulation. He gets into a lot of intimate situations, but the vast majority of them are coercive. He's drugged or he's, you know, he's put on the Mark of Gideon. He's put on a, a fake version of the Enterprise to make him turn to this girl. In Requiem from Methuselah, there is a character who is very clearly uh, set up to compare with Spock. She is an intelligent, scientific person. The first thing she says is, Mr. Spock, I do hope we can find a moment to discuss field density and its relationship to gravity phenomena. And Kirk develops a very hard and fast infatuation with her. There's a desperation to it. And it looks like in that season, it, it's almost a reaction to all this trauma. Of course we know that Spark is, is his security. He literally says in the, one of the earliest episodes uh, to Spark, It gives me emotional security. In Requiem, we see this kind of grasping, clinging to this character. What we have here is, is kind of a structure of parallels, where a lot of these characters that Kirk connects with have a very similar persona or identity. And uh, Akila, she is again a scientist, she's very logical. Akila actually means intelligent and logical. She is basically a version of Spock, she is more openly passionate. Although, ironically, Kirk obviously talks about how passionate Spock is because he sees that in him. Akila, she even says the same kind of phrases and, and words and expressions as Spock. So the point of this is, is that she allows Kirk to feel comfortable enough to open that little door a, a little way, that little chink. We get a little window into what's going on for him. There's something mysterious about Kirk that she doesn't quite get. You need him. Until he talks. And I think he needs you. About Spark. And then she goes, ah, right, I get it. Spark is not in this physically, but he is ever present. This short um, scene is set in between the third season and the motion picture. So this is part of what bridges the gap between that very kind of intense third season where, where, where Kirk is losing his kind of balance and grasping for something, he has this need. And then the motion picture where you see how he has become unhappy and that he's missing a part of himself. Do you love the man? Is he important to you? More important than anything? Is he... as though he were a part of you? The death of Spark is like an open wound. It seems that I have left the noblest part of myself back there on that newborn planet. And when Spark comes back, it's like, Spark? You know. Oh, they know what they are to each other in this film. We need him. I need him. There is an obvious tension. Then my presence is to our mutual advantage. There is an arc to their relationship, and the motion picture rounds that off. Their story is told in parallel with What's Decker it? and Ilea slash Vija. Decker is the replacement Kirk. Spock, he has questions that he can't answer through logic. He 
cannot complete this ritual uh, to become a purely logical being, he's told that his answers lie elsewhere. In the book, we know that he hears telepathically Kirk. Their bond, their link is so strong that he can hear his thoughts. But Spock returns on the premise that he identifies with this entity. What we find later on is that, that, that V'ger wants to know what is beyond logic. It wants to know what it's like to experience connection with uh, humanity. Spock learns that that is, in fact, his answer as well. When we get to the end, we have Ilea slash V'ger and uh, Decker fusing and becoming this one entity. And then we have, slightly earlier, Spock having his epiphany after mind-melding V'ger, where he realizes his life with only logic is incomplete, and he takes Kirk's hand, and we see he connects with his Kirk, and we have the completion of the arc. This simple feeling is beyond Vedra's comprehension. The costume decisions on this are very much like the approach to the, the whole thing, really, trying to evoke the original, but without replicating anything. Yeah, absolutely, that's not really the point. What we did use is an original series of Top for Kirk. Bill Tice was the original costume designer, and he designed this very clean uniform. It's very futuristic, it's very timeless. The curved raglan is the key, and I don't think there's anything to improve on it. The bottom half is more contemporary sci-fi, like a stretch, close fit. And then we use the, the boots uh, as they were in the contemporary Star Trek iteration. And they're a beautiful design, and marrying the two up just seems perfect. The only thing that I would, I would change that I miss a little bit about the costume is that little kick out, that little flare on the, on the, on the original um, pant, because it breaks up the line of, of the uniform a little bit. The naval influence in the original uniform and the original Star Trek, the ship and, the, and the, the, those little details, I think that's what sometimes gets lost in uh, in updating things. And, you know, there was a lot of that kind of detail in the original series. What I didn't have with this uniform, which I have when I wear the, the original series screen replica uniform, is the Cuban heel on the boots. In terms of props, when I originally wrote the piece, I, for whatever reason, didn't include my uh, phone. A lot of people who've met me will, will know that this is actually my phone. It is a, a working communicator smartphone. I altered the script a little bit to use that as a prop. Because why not? The music. Chloe is a genius in my opinion. <laughs> we met at Pride, actually. She started chatting and we started to talk about what we both did. And it turned out she was a composer. This is a part of the story of Kirk and Spock's journey to finding where they, where they meet, where they finally connect. As Edith Keeler said, At his side, as if you've always been there and always will. Which is correct. The fundamental principle of the original series universe is Kirk and Spock are together. If they're apart. And nothing is more important than my ship. Then all events conspire to bring them back together. And of course, the musical style, particularly James Horner, wrote these mirroring themes to describe how the two go together. Uh, we've discussed the idea of it sounding contemporary, as well as reflecting the recognizable Star Trek style, and also the themes of the piece, the nautical themes. It's so evocatively encapsulates those ideas. Watch it again and listen to the music. The journey of uh, Kirk and... Um, Kirk and... I need the wording of this. I wrote it down. Are you distracting? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My producer is distracting me now. <laughs>